Okay, I feel like we're live. Hello. SPARC is a provincial network and we would like to acknowledge the traditional Indigenous land on which we are so fortunate to create and partake in the arts. Our organization is situated in Ontario, which is covered by 46 treaties and other agreements, such as land purchases by the Crown signed between 1781 and 1930, as well as many unceded and disputed territories. What we now call Ontario is home to many Indigenous nations, First Nations peoples, the Métis and Inuit people, who have, worked, who have been the traditional caretakers of this land for many generations and who continue to live, work, and thrive here today. Hi, welcome to Spark Peer-to-Peer -peer Chats. I'm Rachel Marks, the Rezo Spark Network Executive Director. I'm a middle-aged white woman with chin-length blonde and fuchsia hair. Uh, I'm wearing purple cat's eye glasses with sparkles in the corner and a purple top. My pronouns are she and her. And today I'm joining you from Leeds and Grenville County, which is the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and the Haudenosaunee peoples. Uh, the Algonquin and the Mohawk people, uh, and is covered under the Crawford Purchase of 1783, which is fraught with many, many issues that are still being um, fought for today. Uh, today, I'm very excited to welcome three guests, each from a different part of the province, all members of SPARK who are also presenters, specifically music presenters. We have Sandy Irvin, SPARK Board of Directors Chair, Claire Senko, SPARC board member, and Jason Manitowabi, Northern Outreach Coordinator. Uh, why don't I hand it over to each of you to tell us a little bit about yourselves, and we'll start with Sandy. Hello, uh, my name is Sandy Irvin. My pronouns are she, her, elle. I live uh, in Mississippi Mills, which is part of the Mississippi watershed, and very much part of unceded Algonquin territory from time immemorial. I am a middle-aged white lady with curly hair and most other things are subject to change without notice. I am a presenter with Focus Concert Series, which has been running for over 20 years now. Uh, we are a volunteer-driven and volunteer-run organization, but we pay our artists and our technicians like prof the true professionals that they are. Um, that's me. Thank you. Uh, Claire, can we move to you next? Sure. My name is Claire Senko, and um, I'm from the small town Waterford, Ontario, in Norfolk County, which is about an hour and a half southwest of Toronto. And I'm the artistic producer at the Waterford Old Town Hall, which is a multidisciplinary art center. And um, I curate and produce typically um, a spring concert series made up of of uh, folk, folk roots, indie music, but most recently have transitioned to a world music concert series. I'm also the curator and artistic producer at Burning Kiln Winery, at which I um, curate and produce larger, more commercial musical acts. And um, I love, I love my role uh, in these. I love these roles in that I love music and I love building community and bringing people together. Thank you, Claire, that's great. And Jason, take it away. Hello everyone, my name is Jason Manitowabi. I am coming to you from the Wakumakong and Cedar Territory on Manitoulin Island in Northern Ontario. Uh, considered Northern Ontario, it's pretty much right in the middle. Um, but yeah, so I, I am the Northern Outreach Coordinator for Spark. I have been so since uh, 2019. And um, I also recently started a, a position at uh, Wakumakong Tourism, working out of the tourism office as an events coordinator. Um, it sort of uh, led me into that position after working for 10 years uh, for the Bajmajik Theatre Group and helping to build a music program and a recording program and also a music festival at, at that um, institution. Um, so now I generally uh, produce the same festival. I lead it just with more partners, uh, partnering organizations. And um, yeah, I love music. I grew up playing music. Um, I realize it's very, it's a lot of work. Um, so um, I also love to write. So um, 
presenting and um you know uh, finding funds for events and you know having a lot of um experience in in music led me to uh producing events so uh, I'm, I'm sort of a go-to person for several things in my community of Okumakong, which has about 3,500 people living in the community and you know I think uh, between eight and nine thousand registered all over the world. So um, small knit, tight knit community, and uh, you know I um I want to leave as much ladders behind me, uh, you know when I move to the next level for others to use. Uh, that's a little bit about me. That's really beautiful, Jason. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and I'd really also like to say that tonight we're joined by a uh, Spark board member, Gordon Duff. Gordon, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yeah, so as part of the Minto Arts Council, we do a very small series called uh, Basement Cafe, uh, kind of a coffee house held in the basement of the historic uh, Harrison Carnegie Library. And uh, through Spark, I'm certainly exposed to a lot of other musical events with uh, Claire and Sandy and all the other talented people. So. Uh, I'm interested to hear about the challenges we all face in rural communities and uh, <clears throat> small budgets and uh, trying to stay viable but relevant to the community as well. Thanks, Gordon. And really quickly on that, if you're coming to Symposium on May 24, you will get to see that library and the space where that music uh, series happens. Uh, so yeah, okay. I'm really excited about tonight's chat. I think everyone knows that I'm a theater kid. Uh, so I'm really interested in learning more about music and, and especially music in rural areas. So let's talk about presenting music and music series in rural and remote Ontario. So I have some questions and I'm just gonna ask them to the group and just chime in and answer however feels natural. But my first question is, Honestly, how important is it to your local community to provide music and opportunities to attend concerts? Anyone? Sandy? Sure. Um, so I should say that we're not the only source of music in our community. We have a sister series that's a classical music series. We've had jazz series come and go. Uh, we are lucky enough to exist in a community with a certain amount of artistic infrastructure. The town fathers built a town hall in around 1868 and that included an auditorium it holds 200 people it has wonderful acoustics and later community members ensure that there was a stage and lights and sound equipment so that's not something that every rural community has i've met presenters who use ski lodges out of season um, so we're very lucky to have that resource and that's one of the reasons our series started was so that space didn't go to waste um, Acknowledging that, I think music is very important for community building. Uh, one of the things we do is offer a reason to get out of the house in winter because that's when our series runs. There's so much going on in the warmer months that we don't try to compete with planting or the fair or the summer festival circuit. We run in the winter. Um, the, the joke is that we start after moose season and we finish before plowing. And it's a really nice chance for neighbors to get to see neighbors without a park at, at the end of the road, um, face to face chat, maybe have a beverage and that community building piece, especially in a community like ours, which is we're on the outskirts of Ottawa and we are growing and changing and becoming a bit of a bedroom community. So as newcomers to the community enter, this is one way for them to meet folks who are regulars who like the same things they do. Um, and I think all our concert series and musical activities in the community serve that function of community building. Thank you. Thank you so much. Claire, Jason, either of you like to jump on this, this question? Sure. I, um, one of the, I think this is something that we're all probably gonna say throughout this chat, um, the phrase community building. I think um, just jumping on what Sandy said, it's so important to build community and it's so important to build community through the arts. Otherwise, we're gonna lose folks going to the city where there's much more access to concerts and you're a theater kid, great theater. And even this past weekend, I saw some great theater and you know, 
we typically in my community, if you wanted to experience uh, a great concert or, you know, see an artist that you might have heard on the radio or on CBC, it, it wasn't going to happen uh, in this rural area. Uh, so building the series, sort of asking me what's important, you know, why, why we do this and what's important about this. Um, I think it's to provide um, easier access to folks in rural communities to the arts, which I believe we deserve just as much as someone who is in an urban community. Uh, and and the side, um, I guess the side effects of that are building community and folks gathering, getting to know one another. And then you find your kindred spirits in the community by gathering in community spaces like old town halls and community centers. And then you find folks who have the same kind of philosophical outlook as you, love the same music. It's, it's like a universal thing. If you build it, they will come. If you give access to it um, and you smooth the road to it, uh, folks will start figuring that out and, and gathering together. And we're just sort of facilitating that by creating these these opportunities and these events and and then the community kind of informs the way they want to move forward and they're like we really love this artistry we really love this series and then this sort of conversation happens between the venue and the presenting body and the community and then it just becomes like I also think Sandy used the word organic it becomes organic and um it but it starts with making a choice and a, de a decision and to, to do something like this, to present a series. I apologize for my voice, by the way. Jason? <laughs> oh, Jason, I think you're muted. I am muted. <laughs> Great answers. Yes. Um, so it's extremely important to me to continue to do what I do. Um, you know, um, aside from being looked up, to by uh, younger people. Um, I kind of want to be that person that I needed and also follow the, the lead of those who provided me that, that those opportunities. I was fortunate to have um, mentors growing up and people who saw things in me, uh, aside from my friends who sort of shoved me on the stage and said, we know you can do this, so you do it in front of us and you know you need to share that. So I, I began to learn that very young that um, if you're gifted with uh, something, you know, a, a gift like that, um, you should, it's almost your duty to uh, to share it. So, um, you know, um, I didn't ask questions when people asked me to sing somewhere. I, I just, uh, you know, took it, um, I took honor to that and just share as much as I could. Um, and like I mentioned before, it's very hard. I grew up at Crystal Shawanda, uh, pretty, we used to ride the, 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 the preschool bus with her so that's how far we go back and I watched her how hard she worked and I just you know I, I wasn't I was enjoying my life um a little bit different when I was a teenager and just to watch her like work hard every time she had an idea she would leave the group and go work on it in the room while we were all still doing you know young people stuff so uh, just to watch, realize how hard it was, I thought, uh, you know, I, I thought it was easier and I kind of regretted it being young. So now that I'm older and more mature, I want to make sure that I, I um, help people make better decisions, I guess. Um, and, um, you know, I still love music and I think it's important to, uh, to provide uh, my community with, you know, that sort of entertainment and, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a, always a challenge, you know, you can't make everybody happy, but that's, you know, that's uh, the way everything goes, I think. But um, at the end of the day, people can appreciate um, hardworking, like-minded folks um, who, you know, go out to the into the world and bring something back to your small community. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just looking forward to next year's lineup. And I like what Sandy said about the winter, because up here we have a pretty good winter. And um, yeah, so... That's probably the best time to, um, you know, uh, share stories. It has it's always been in my culture. Uh, you're spending a lot of time with uh, your family and your community in these, um, you know, intimate settings. So, yeah, the best time is uh, moose hunting's right around the corner. <laughs> now, but yeah.
Thank mm -hmm. you all so much. Um, really quickly to anyone who's watching on Facebook, I am, when you see me look down, I'm looking at my phone to see if there's any questions or comments that I can bring back to the group. So please feel free to type anything you want. But in the meantime, we have some more questions. So I'm a first time presenter. What advice would you give me? Hmm, well, maybe I could, I, I remember my first, my first festival when, was when I was just, I just turned 19. So um, I've had a lot of chance to make a lot of mistakes. So <laughs> I guess that's what, um, but I remember back then was um, I needed to make sure I, I realized what I was getting into. So when I walked into um, the position was open and I was only 19, there was no staff left. It kind of dispersed the whole the whole member, the membership of um, the festival had sort of broken up and there was only a few more key people and they kind of encouraged me and put me in that spot. Uh, of course, they guided me. So what I did was I went through the whole filing cabinet and it took me about two months to, you know, research everything that everyone else had done before me. And of course, um, you know, you have to lean on the people that you know. Um, to and you just don't be afraid to ask questions and it, it's 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 scary you you have no idea it keeps you up at night but um you know just believe in what you you know you can do and um you know you wouldn't be in that position if uh, you didn't put yourself there so um my advice would be just to uh you know take the jump and um just do your research and find the support that you need and um you have to uh, be prepared that, like I said earlier, as an artist, you're going to get challenged and just, you know, stick to what you believe in and, um, you know, the right people will see that. And it takes hard work. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm a, curious to see what um, everybody else has to say about this because I'm going to probably steal some of that advice as well because I'm learning every day still. I can go next. Um... The first gig I presented was also when I was about 19. It was a benefit for Amnesty International, and it was a show with, I think, 10 punk bands on the bill uh, in Hamilton. And uh, my music tastes and career have evolved since then, but the fundamentals are it's an entrepreneurial gig. You've got to have certain details at your fingertips and lots of support, as Jason mentioned. You know, you're going to be calling on friends and acquaintances and people you haven't met who can help you. So first rule is pay your bands. <laughs> if you can't set it up so the bands get paid, it's not worth doing. Uh, second rule is pay your tax because they will make or break you. And an unhappy tax can really break you quickly. Um, after that, everything else is gravy. Um, once you've got a track record of success, that's when you can start looking for funding and sponsorship and everything else. Those first few gigs, you kind of have to start small and, and build up your reputation a bit. So I would say that as a first time presenter, you should start small. Make sure you've got the lay of the land and then grow. Thank you both. Claire, would you like to add anything? Sure, my screen temporarily froze. That's another another fun thing about being in a rural community. <laughs> Internet is not always reliable. Um, I think I think I'm going to say something where I'm going to address some practical things. Um, I mean, I heard a part of what you said, Sandy, and I heard what, uh, what you said, Jason, and I totally agree with all of that. Um, and in terms of, of practical advice, I would say have very high standards in terms of tech and sound. If you're presenting a concert um, in a community center, if you're presenting a concert in a high school auditorium or wherever you are in old town hall, um, keep the bar really high in terms of the tech experience for both the uh, artist and the audience. Uh, I partnered very early in my career with a tech company that I um, I believed in and in and delivered a great uh, experience to the audience and for the artists. And when artists walk into a venue and they're going to perform, the least of their worries should be that they sound okay. Um, so rely on those experts and don't and don't um, 
don't let that be something that you scrimp on. And the other piece I think would be um, hospitality. Take really good care of your artists. When they come into your community, especially if it's the first time, show them who you are and show them what your community is all about and take as good care of them as you possibly can. Um, in addition to all of those other, other pieces, those are two unwavering um, standards and uh, deliverables that I've carried with me for the past 15 years or so. Great. I'm going to flip this a little bit. So we've talked about advice for presenters, but what about artists who are hoping to be programmed for the first time? What advice would you give to an artist just starting out? How do they, how do they move forward? How do they get on the bill? Jason. I would, um, I'm going to speak from some of my own experience. Um, you have to, you really have to work hard and, and show your commitment, um, you know, to, to, um, sort of, you know, um, get yourself into that gig, I guess, you know, um, I'm just trying to think about all the mistakes I made when I was younger. And, um, uh, as far as artists, I look forward to um, people who are uh, genuine and they understand and respectful and, you know, um, it's all artists are different, but the ones I really notice, um, people will st still send to me um, the old portfolios, you know, when you used to have an artist kit. And I can always appreciate when somebody will, you know, be um humble enough or 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 just you know show show me that you know they they really want to work hard at this and get noticed and not only just um they let they don't only let their talent speak but also their genuine personality so when somebody goes the extra mile to put enough work together to you know put something like that together i i give them a little bit more of a look and i give them a chance and i know what it feels like uh when you're a young artist to be put on a, a stage with on the same bill with some of these you know these big headliners it does wonders it could do wonders for you know it did wonders for me I always remembered you know being on the same stage so um, I always give young artists who are um, willing to put into work um, a, a really good chance and um, I, I don't know what else to add to that except for I'm excited to hear what some of our other presenters uh, would like to share. Great, thank you. Claire, Sandy, anything to add for emerging artists? I'm gonna let Claire go first. Okay. Hi, I was relying on you, Sandy, <laughs> to jump in. I really love what Jason said about um, being genuine. Like the first thing that popped into my head is authenticity. I'm instantly attracted to an artist that I don't have to kind of go through any weeds to figure out who they really are. Um, when, you know, really we come to see a show um, in addition to the skill and the work that they put in um, to hone their craft, you don't want to have to go through weeds to figure out who that person is to access their soul. Um, another, another thing that I look for, I don't know why I'm just going to be totally erring on the practical here, um, but like when I go to a show, I love, I love the music, I love, you know, the output of the artist, but in between the songs, I love an artist that's engaging. I love an artist that can connect with the audience. And I look for that when I go to conferences, when I go to FMO, which is Folk Music Ontario, uh, a conference that I go to, have gone to for many years. I'm not just looking at that artist's skill set and how they sing and how they bear their soul in the song, but how they instantly can connect to the audience. I think it's really important to go and see an artist live. Don't just go online. Um, but, you know, actually experience that artist before you program them, if possible. And I would say, oh, yeah, I'm flipping this. I'm missing the question. Uh, so advice to an artist um, would be uh, don't be afraid to bear your soul. Don't be afraid to be, you know, your authentic self um, and engage, engage, engage. Be as engaging as you possibly can on social media on stage, at conferences, 
like speak to people, make connections, talk to people, and don't just come with your A game, just come as you are, come as yourself. And presenters, we've, we see artists all the time. We'll immediately pick up that spark that's in you, even if you're having a bad day. We just wanna see you. And we wanna feel that like artist presenter chemistry with you and trust that you're the right person to bring into our community. I'm so glad you said what you said, Claire, and I'm going to say some different practical things. Um, I would say, first of all, I want to mention, shout out to Folk Music Ontario as well, which is one of the main places uh, folk presenters like myself and Claire find artists. It is worth your while to go. It can cost money, budget for it and save up for it. When you go, there may be alcohol and other substances. You can decide if you're there to party or if you're there to make, meet presenters. They are not the same thing. Um, there's nothing wrong with either state, but you, you've got to make your choice about how you're budgeting that, that time and energy. Um, I love getting a personal pitch from an artist. I really resent getting a blanket pitch from an agent or an artist who hasn't bothered to look up what my series is when I present what I do. So I discard a lot of pitches because they're just not right for my venue or they're the long time of year. I think that, excuse me, I've had agents chase me for months only to find out I don't present in June and, and they're mad at me. And I'm like, you can find that out. Most are, most presenters put that information forward for the artists. So I would agree hundred percent, be sincere, be well-crafted, be yourself, be honest about what you can do for a series um, and be responsive. When they say, hey, I'd like to book you, follow up. When they say, I'd really like a stage plot, please send a stage plot. Please send the stage plot for the show you're actually booking and not the four other guys you decide to add at the last minute, which will have a sound tech pulling his hair out and ready to kill you. If they're a good sound tech, you'll still get a good show, but it's really not fair to everybody involved. Uh, to bring friends at the last minute on a gig like that. That's that's just not appropriate. Um, so that's that's my practical advice is, is uh, and you know, everything we've said, Jason mentioned an EPK and putting uh, effort into your self-presentation, that time spent in advance before you hit the road, before you hit the market will really pay off in the long run. It means that presenters will use your best shot instead of the one they could find on social media which is, you know, we hope a flattering shot. Um, they'll use your best audio instead of the video that was taken at a bar four years ago. Um, all of those things really add up to your, your, your road presence and your future. And we talk to each other too. So if you have a good gig at one place, their friends are going to hear about it down the road. You know, we're going to call each other and say, you won't believe this guy or you won't believe this young woman we heard. Um, we all want to lift up the young artists in our own communities, but we're also quite prepared to lift up the young artists from other communities. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to go to Gordon for a question. Thanks, Grace. I wanted to build on what Claire said about it's not just musical artistry, but the between song banter is good. And I think I want to also add how you read the room, because our most successful ones is the artist has said, did we have a bunch of like baby boomers that want some rock or something? Or do we have people that are in a humorous thing and we want to hear your jokes? Or some of them are storytellers and, and they say, well, I, I've said much like Jason would be like, where they come from and what was the idea for this song and that too. And um, sometimes they're not the best singers or musicians, but they really connect with the audience. And an intimate venue like ours, that's very critical. So just uh, a, a non-artistic thing, a uh, bit, bit of marketing, I think. Well, I consider it theater. <laughs> but, but hey, you know, I'm always going to take it there. No, just kidding. It, it is, I think... I really love that too. When I go to see an artist and, and when they're talking between the show, between even just on Saturday, I was at a West porch, which is everyone's on um, porches outside in Westport. It was great. And um, one of the singers was like, oh, wow, like that song, whenever I sing it, it's higher pitch than I remember. And I was like, 
Oh, I, I kind of like that banter, like that honesty. And again, that authenticity said, like as a pure, just audience going human, I really appreciate that. So thank you all. I'm going to bundle some questions together um, here. So um, like, how do you choose who to program? You've told us what you're looking for, but how do you choose who to program? Is there a process you use? And what is block booking? So I'm throwing that out there. Anyone can, who, Sandy, you feel free to take that one first. Feeling good? Sure. Um, personally, and, and I've con con curated children's series and adult series, I'm looking for a story arc through the season. So I want to have a few factors. I need representation. I try to have an equal number of male and female performers, performers who identify el elsewhere as well. Um, we try not to just present one kind of folk music. It's a big tent. There's a lot of categories. So we do aim for one comic comedic show that is really going to connect with the audience. So I'm I'm thinking about those things in the background, but that striking anchor artist that I'm going to book first is is probably a little out of my budget, but I'm hoping it will sell the rest of my series. So there's that's part of my arc too. And then the other factors I'm considering is local representation. All of our openers are from my own area. We're hoping to to give them some support and you know the next step up to the next level of presentation. Um, so that that factors into it too for me. Um, our series has not done a lot of block booking because our timing is different from a lot of other series. We do on occasion, but I can certainly describe what block booking is for us. Block booking is when you partner up with other folks who are doing the same thing as you and you negotiate a group rate. And uh, from a presenter standpoint, it's amazing because suddenly you have a hole in your schedule filled and you've got a guaranteed rate that's good and it's a little more cost effective from the artist standpoint. It is also excellent because they've got X number of dates lined up where they don't have to hustle. They know exactly what their tour schedule is going to be. And it's a reasonable distance between dates and they know they're going to get paid at the end. And they also like that. And, you know, they've got, they've got a bed for each night between. And those are the realities of touring. If someone can build in some laundry schedule in there for them, they're really, really happy. So that's, that's uh, my artistic process and my view on black booking. Thank you. Claire, Jason, either of you like to add anything about your process or how you choose acts? Uh, um, Jason, you want to go? I don't yeah, know if you're fine. muted. I was trying to <laughs> mute, <laughs> but uh, I was going to say, how do I choose acts? Um, it's really hard to read what my community is going to enjoy i know what they want they want john fogarty um and i don't know he's you know maybe we're not at that stage yet um i remember i joked with uh d wayne crystal crystal schwanda's husband said we should call jesus and ask how much for johnny cash and it was hilarious but um that's what they want but you know uh in order to build a successful event uh like sandy said you have to start small don't you know don't um try to swing for a home run um you know you want to you know you want to be sustainable so uh, i think the first uh, for this new festival which went to in sixth year this summer um i reached out to crystal and um you know people artists and friends that i know who live on the circuit and um sort of uh you know get their opinion on some of the ideas i had so they'll straight up tell you that works but you know this is what i saw over here so what i did was i I sorry, my kids are dancing around in the back. But I um I brought Tanya Tagok to my reserve, and not a lot of people knew who she was. But what that did was it it um you know it it made a lot of waves in the in the community of uh, presenters. They were like, "This is your first event, and you had this lineup at Crystal, and I had a bunch of programming going on." And I wasn't sure if it was going to work, but um, you know, um, a lot of my peers and my um you know supporters said, "Trust the process." Um, you know, um, it'll help. I also think it's important to show people new music and um, especially for my community, indigenous artists who um, do important things 
and invite them to our community to sort of uh, give off that radiance and that aura that they bring to help, um, you know, inspire the artists that we have here. Because there are a lot of artists in my district, um, you know, a lot of working artists per capita, the numbers are pretty high. So uh, I think it's important to uh, show people, um, you know, take them outside of their comfort zone and, you know, re be creative and show them that, you know, there are so many disciplines and you never know who you're going to inspire in your community to, uh, to do that. So, um, yeah, I rely a lot on um, my uh, friends who are traveling to festivals all year round to, uh, you know, give me advice and tell me about my ideas. So that's my little, um, that's how I go about doing things and block booking is um, I'm starting to learn more about it. It's kind of hard in my area, but I'm starting to find that Highway 6 and the ferry is a good little route for, from Northern Ontario, you know, from the South. So um, I'm gonna start looking into block booking. Um, it's a little bit tricky when people have a, a clause, um, you know, if you have an artist, like the island is small. So if somebody's playing in the town that's, uh, you know, 30 kilometers next to you. Sometimes artists have agreements um, on, you know, clauses where, you know, you have to be a certain distance away from them in order to, you know, they won't let you book the same artists if uh, you're in the next, or they won't allow the artist to pick up a venue that's, uh, you know, strung just 30 kilometers away. And I think we're working hard to try to eliminate that. Um, you know in our string of network uh, presenters so yeah i'm interested to hear what uh oh, thank what you say. okay anyone else have anything they'd like to add to that or i i wanted to yes yeah, sandy and then i'm going to zone in on something that claire said earlier about audience i just want to highlight two things that jason said before we move on and one is spreading the radiance of the artists in your own community. And I love that, Jason. That's such a beautiful sentiment, but it's not just a sentiment, it's a mission for you. And, and that's mm -hmm. wonderful. I love it when you can connect practicing senior artists with younger artists and, and watch them light up. That's amazing. But the other thing you said is we should call up Jesus and ask for Johnny Cash. And that is a song. And that needs <laughs> I to be a song. I love that. That did is we, so great. Did we hear from Claire on, on this question? Claire, would you like to? Uh, did you feel you had? I wasn't sure if you did or not. I'll just be brief. Um, in terms of choosing, in terms of choosing the artist, I really like um, the idea of zoning in on how artists are already being routed. So at the beginning, in the beginning days, I started to notice. I would go for artists that I thought my community deserved to have programmed and in this area and artists that were not being uh, programmed in this area. Sort of that's how I honestly did start out uh, producing shows. And then I started to see where those artists, how artists were being routed. And as a new presenter, sometimes if you can hop on a route, instead of doing a one-off, you pay less for that artist because they're on a tour. Um, Jason alluded to uh, radius clauses. So often as a first time presenter, you're going to like have a question about a radius clause. And that just means like, are you gonna put a radius clause in? Does that mean, you know, if this artist plays at my venue, they can't play within a hundred kilometers of me, or you have to look out for if this artist is playing elsewhere, can I, can I actually book them? So those are important kind of like little, little word, like buzzwords and contract words you would, you would typically come across. Um, another quick thing is, I think that when you decide to produce shows in your community or present shows in your community, you are stepping into the shoes of being a leader, a cultural leader. And with that comes responsibility, uh, I believe for me, I take that on. And one of the one of the responsibilities is to diversify your lineup, make sure there's diversity. It was really easy in the early days. You can put a bunch of white men on your stage till kingdom come. And that's just that's just how it is. And when you go, hang on a second, there are just as many talented um, uh, female singer songwriters. Um, I did a, a, a queer voices, a female and queer voices series a, a few years ago. We have the ability to lead and amplify marginalized voices. And I think once we do that as um, 
as, as folks that have decided I'm gonna be a presenter and I'm gonna do things in my community. I think those are shoes we step into and then there's responsibilities that come with that. And there's more, but that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> No, this is a great segue into audience. I wanted to talk a little bit about audience development. Um, you know, how do you attract audiences and how do you make sure you're providing artistic content that your community will appreciate or that they need? Like you've just said, Claire, like diverse. So so would you like to talk a little bit more about that before we pass pass the hat? Sure. Um <clears throat> I think it's building street cred kind of. So when you start presenting artists on your stage and you 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 know decide to produce a concert series, uh, you bring artists in that your community is excited to see. Uh, and you know, at the in the very beginning days, it was a mix of artists that people kind of had recognition, like they recognized who they were, and then artists that were emerging that you could mix into the series and sell the entire series to folks and they would get to see all of the artists and hopefully come for the the marquee name and and then also attend the you know the other see the other artists and then as you're building that that credibility with your audience and earning their trust building your reputation all of those things are in place they come in they get a great experience the sound is fantastic um, it feels good another thing that uh, I've done from the beginning is I have a designer come in and create uh, an experience for the audience and a special marquee and like on tobacco board, handwritten, hand, we little, you know, candles in the space. We make the space feel good. Uh, and once, you know, you start attracting folks to your venue and they start trusting your programming, you can then say, hey, like you've never heard of this artist or like a couple of years ago, I'm going to present a world music series in this white bread town. And there are going to be, you know, folks of color on the stage and there is going to be, you know, an entire concert that's going to be sung in Portuguese. But you're going to love it because you trust us. Right. So come and see these shows. You can then diversify even more. You can then excite your audience and draw them, not because you're presenting shows that they've heard of this artist before, but you're drawing them because they can't wait to see what you're gonna do next. Amazing, I love that. Sandy, Jason, anything you'd like to add on audience development and making sure they're getting what the community would like? Well, I went to Folk Music Ontario and Folk Music International, and I started to go to festivals and um, just to see what everybody was doing. And I brought all those ideas back. I think the it was the second year that we did our festival. Um, you know, I, I went into a lot of workshops at Folk Music Ontario and asked a lot of questions. Uh, and people will tell you what they did that was worked and what didn't. Um, so what we one idea I had was, why don't we build this huge guitar made out of you know light wood and and cardboard and light it on fire so um that really that was really huge like it, it was something that had nobody had ever seen like uh, at any of the local festivals um obviously it's you know you're still a little bit off burning man but it's a successful event and another thing is families uh, we wanted to make sure that we had entertainment for uh, all ages, and uh, an important part of that was making sure that your uh, audience and the the sort of um, demographic, you know, uh, there's something for everybody. And in my community, uh, we just like Sandy had mentioned, we we need to uh, we bring locals onto the stage. The locals bring their families; those families bring their friends, and. Um, Don Bernstein came here in 2006, and one of the things he said up on the stage, and it always stuck with me, was, you guys have seen these local bands probably a hundred times, and you still get up and support them and dance to the good songs, you know, the fast songs that they play, and get engaged with the, the, the songs that they perform, and, um, you know, a lot of communities can learn something about, you know, what you do here, and you support your your own, and that always stuck with me. So um, I try to stay true to that. Sandy, would you like to add? So audience development is, is 
I think something every presenter has to grapple with, regardless of what they're presenting, whether they're presenting theater or children's entertainment or puppet shows or folk music. You have to know who's in your community and who's going to come out at the time you're presenting. In my case, my demographic actually skews pretty old and white. And we are constantly attempting to reach out to students and younger people and newcomers to the town. And sometimes we succeed and sometimes we don't. And we've tried different formulas like offering student tickets, uh, changing up our programming hours. Uh, we've offered matinees for families with the artists that we're bringing in. Some of these initiatives have worked and some of them haven't. Um, but the last few years we've had Pre-COVID, we had five years in a row sold out every show. And that was amazing. And, and that has left us with money in the bank to experiment with other programming during and after COVID, you know, programming directly in the community outside of our venue, programming outside during COVID because we had money in the bank and we could pay artists. Um, we will continue working on audience development and one of our new tools, we have a new volunteer, who's an expert in surveys. So we're gonna survey the community a bit more about things like what time should our shows start? We started them at eight o'clock forever. And one of our board members said, hey, what if we started at 7.30? Do you think people would mind? I'd like to get to bed earlier. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> we can ask, um, you know, is the volume too loud? Is it not loud enough? Do you want more rock and roll? Do you want less rock and roll? What if we throw something different? What if we throw a barn dance instead of a concert? We're asking those questions of our community and we're really hoping that the stories they tell us back will be informative and helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm cognizant of the fact that we're getting close to an hour. So I'm gonna leave the other two heavy questions about funding, because I think these are things that we talk about and, 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 can, and can relate to in the arts overall. But what I'd really like you know, it's funny because Chris always says, Chris Lind always says, we want to hear the success stories, right? And we do. We want to make sure and hear that we're we're connected to other people that are doing something and that if they can do it, like maybe I can take that. So you've all given some great advice. And so what I'd like to ask is, can you each, and Gordon, I'm going to ask you this too, can you each share with us one story that sums up why you do what you do or why your work is important to you? That's a big one, I know. But Sandy, you're unmuted, so I'm gonna call on you first. Sure thing, and it's easy for me. Before I tell my story, I have to mention, I have a note here. We've all mentioned Folk Music Ontario. We've all mentioned what a great resource it is for us as presenters. Their next concert is coming up, or not concert, conference. It's three days of music. It's a very intense experience. It's in London, Ontario this year, and it runs from October 12th to 15th. You can check out the Folk Music Ontario website, just Google Folk Music Ontario for details on the concert. If it's an easy travel for you at this late date, it is maybe worth your while popping in. If not, it's worth putting on your radar for next year. But Spark is hosting a showcase there this year, and I'm absolutely delighted that we are going to be centering and showcasing rural artists and saying we're important too. Uh, at such an important venue. Um, so many artists have moved out of the traditional community of Toronto to other communities across Ontario where they can afford to live and work. And some of them are new to their own new base and some of them are alive and thriving in those communities. So that's wonderful. For my success story, last year, I got a little extra funding for a special project. <laughs> Sorry, federally, through Ontario Presents. And it was for an artist residency in my community. And I got to work with two local artists who had been struggling since COVID to even think of performing, to even think of songwriting. And I got to put them together to work with each other. Um, there was a lot of supportive phone calls and Zoom calls where they were working out how to work together. Uh, we ended up being able to pay them to work and write instead of working at their day jobs, um, which was really gratifying. Uh, we were also able to host a free community event featuring those artists, which was a, like a songwriter's day uh, at a local cafe uh, where they basically hosted an open mic. And it was really interesting because there was obviously a real appetite for that. We had people come from miles around, guys trucking in with all our guitars and amps. And I, I had to say at the door, 
I'm really sorry. This is an acoustic event. You can put the, event, the amp back. You are welcome to play. We had to limit how many songs people could play because we had so many signed up. But then we had their main stage performance. And it was so neat to hear them play with full confidence. It's funny when Jason said people bring their families. We always comp the families <laughs> for our shows. But the families of the families definitely paid for their tickets and they were definitely there cheering. Uh, but so were their friends and neighbors. And people who had known them maybe from working at the general store or working at a local retail environment and then realizing, oh, this person I've known for so long is so talented and I had no idea. And, and lifting those artists up, Brock Seaman and Vicki Brittle, um, and giving them the, a moment in the spotlight for everyone to see just how good they were and to say, these artists are the equal of every main stage performer we've ever brought in and we think they're just as important. That was, that was my busy, biggest success. Thank you, thank you so much. I'm gonna go down on my screen to Jason and then we'll go to Claire and then Gordon. Thank you. Okay, um, if I remember the question, it's just, well, are we telling you about like some of the good stories? Uh, just yeah. One big good success or one thing that sums up why, why you do what you do. Well, um, this this past this last festival that uh, I led in August, um, we weren't sure who to you know aim for as a headliner, and um, just going through all my emails, like I get emails like blanket emails from you know um, artist managers and booking agents, and uh, one of the names that popped up was Julie Black, so I made an inquiry. Um, and one of the first things that uh, I just wanted to mention this just to like as a presenter on my side of things is one of the first things that uh, the the talent, the, the artist management was asking was, OK, uh, what size venue is there a direct flight and all these big questions, because that's the job of an, uh, an artist managers to get the very best for their artist. And I was just honest. I said. There's no direct flight. You're gonna, you know, you'll probably be have, spend the same amount of time driving from Toronto if you want instead of flying to Sudbury, and then driving from Sudbury. I said you're gonna be singing for community members, uh, residential school survivors, their families. Um, you know, think you're not. It's not MSG, a sold out stadium. It's a a humble, intimate crowd, and you know that's. I'm gonna be honest. That's who you'll be performing for. So they took that to. Uh, Julie Black and she said, I liked the way you put that. And I wanna, you know, I wanna do this. And we're willing to meet you, you know, any as far as we can, halfway to make this happen. Um, and at the end of the show, when she jumped on the stage, she knew exactly how to interact with the crowd. And she brought every young person, even not just young people, everybody rushed to the stage, you know, at the first verse of her song. And Kids were crying. She, she went into the crowd. She was, you know, so interactive. And, you know, it was um, such an amazing experience, you know, and uh, um, it was just so great to see that, um, you know, kids just having such a great time. And she, you know, she she made a, a really personal video and put that on her page. And, uh, you know, it's been shared and liked. And um, just this thing she had to say about our community was made it all worth, uh, you know, um just having uh you know the the verse lineup that we had um and just to hear her say you know things like that was you know it just it just really you know it was the cherry on top of uh you know all the hard work that we put together and uh, yeah just to make sure that um and the, the community of course saying that was a really great show thank you you know the appreciativeness and even the people that say well this is what i you know i'd like to see next year that always helps too so yeah. Thank you, Claire. Over to you. Jeez, I have like three stories in my head, so I'm not sure which one is going to pop out. Oh, you know, um, I think, yeah, I think I'll talk about the music stroll. Um, during the pandemic, obviously, live music evaporated from the face of the earth and uh, theater as well. And having, you know, developed a, a concert series and built, built community around 
around music here in Waterford. Um, we had relationships with folks in the community and um, dialogue with folks in the community. And then when that was all set down or shut down, uh, the first question we kind of asked ourselves was, what can we do? Like, what can we do? Like, what is is uh, a solution? You know, if if only a stopgap solution to this. So what we did was we created something called the Main Street Music Stroll, and we, uh, <laughs> my intern and I. Uh, at the beginning of the summer, basically like accosted people on their lawns and in their gardens and said, hi, you have a really nice lawn and a really nice porch and Main Street in Waterford is very beautiful. Would you put an artist on your, would you allow us to program an artist on your lawn? So there's nothing against, you know, an artist playing a guitar and singing on a lawn. Um, would you allow that to happen and, you know, maybe put an extension cord out for them so that they can kind of plug in and play like every, I think it was every Thursday. Um, throughout the summer, and this is a 2020. And first of all, that piece of like having credibility in the community, um, it was already there. So we were able to do that and not be super creepy. Um, everyone said yes, 100% of the folks said yes. And then we put it out to musicians who were out of work and said, hey, do you want to do this? Um, and we had a huge response and they just put out their guitar case. This wasn't a fundraiser for the hall. This wasn't this was this was just about reaching our community and doing something that we could do when there was no music. And I remember the first stroll. Um, people, we call it after a while. We were just stroll or roll because it's kind of ableist. If you're like, not everyone can stroll. There were strollers. There were wheelchairs. There were all sorts of folks rolling and walking through the streets. Um, people were weeping. People were, we, I was weeping. I would walk, I was like hearing music again and experiencing live music again. And this went all through 2020. We did it again in 21. We did it again in 22 because it just, it was so much fun and so great for the community. And this is the first year that we, we didn't do it. We just brought everyone back together for a typical outdoor music uh, series on our lawn. So that's, that's to me something that I will carry with me for the rest of my life, something very beautiful. Thank you so much. Gordon, Mental Arts Council. Sure. Um, I'll give you a quick happy story from last night. <laughs> so this was the Culture Days one. And we had uh, a reading of local poetry and then a new mystery writer followed by uh, two local singers in music. And they did about an hour and 10 minutes. And I got a thank you note this morning um, says, Thank you for inviting me to the Clifford Coffee House last night. This was in uh, a, a woman from Fergus has uh, bought a kind of a rundown variety store and just totally renovated it. And we just cleared out her tables and merchandise and set up chairs in this beautiful, I think it's an 1880 building and that we just uh, had it there. So very small, like 35 people. And she said, it was a fun evening and I appreciated the opportunity to present my books. Please relay my appreciation to the Mental Arts Council and the Clifford Country Store. It's great to have this kind of support for the arts in our local small communities. And like Clifford is population in 900. And I know I've been telling you about people from the city coming here. Well, there was a couple from Elliott Lake who moved to Clifford and said they were astonished to find there was this kind of activity in their new hometown. So, you know, like it's a small thing, but you do reach a few people and maybe to build an audience and they'll come to other presentations that we have. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you all so much. This has been great. And it's been really wonderful um, to hear, you know, different pieces of advice and stories. And I think it will definitely help out any um, burgeoning producers and presenters. Um, I do want to just quickly um, highlight, and Jason, I know I'd ask you this, but I'm just going to hope you don't mind. Ontario Presents Artist Showcases, um, uh, their virtual artist showcases are I think that's next week, the second, third, and fourth. Um, please check out their website. There's still time to register to attend. All the artists have been chosen. And again, 
FMO if you're able to go. I'm so excited. It's my first time I get to go this year. Um, so Sandy and Eric are going to show me around and show me the ropes and hopefully I'll learn a lot more about the music business in Ontario and the some of the amazing artists. Um, while we're here, I just want to also give a shout out to the CPN small venue pitches, which happened at the beginning of September that showcased 31 artists across genres. And hopefully, Eric, you and the CPN will continue to present that with Spark support. Um, thanks, everyone. Next month, please join us right here. Uh, well, actually, on Zoom, not Facebook, uh, on Monday, October 30th at 7 p.m. for our virtual annual general meeting. Um, posters or postings will be going up shortly with the link to register, um, and we look forward to seeing folks there. And if you don't know if you're a member or not, email me and let me know. Uh, and I can look up on our directory really quick. And if you're not, there's still time to become a member so that you can vote on all things Spark at our AGM. So I want to say thanks to the folks on Facebook for watching. I am going to stop our live now. Um, we hope to see you again. We've got lots of peer-to-peer -peer chats coming up this year. Um, we're hoping to have an introduction to IPA, the Indigenous Performing Arts Alliance. We will be talking with the folks from the Black Pledge about the workshops they have, their anti-Black racism workshops they've got coming up. Um, and anything else, if you have a suggestion or something that you'd really like to see, just let us know. So thanks everyone out on social media. We will see you soon. Bye. Okay, now I'm going to stop the recording.